Shape the future with E-Series. Le grandi conquiste si fanno insieme. Intellimec, il consorzio intelligente per la meccatronica. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh my God. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Mazzolai. I'm the general co chair of uh, IRIN 2020 together with the Professor Domenico Pratichizzo. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the first plenary speaker of the conference, Professor Jenny Peck. Professor Jenny Peck is director and founder of the Reconfigurable Robotics Lab of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne and a core member of the Swiss National Centers of Competence in Research Robotics Consortium. She has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia, and she achieved her PhD at the Seoul National University in South Korea before completing her postdocs at both the Université Pierre Marie Curie in Paris and Harvard University. Her current research interest involves soft robotics. In particular, Jamie is one of the pioneers in the field of self-morphing robot uh, origami, the so-called robogamics. And there are robots that change their shape in 2D or 3D by folding predefined patterns and sequences so therefore, they can be used in several applications, such as medical, uh, automobile, space, wearable robots. And uh, JAMI has uh, several publications on these topics uh, in uh, prestigious journals. But very important, she is also co-founder of uh, Foldaway Haptis, a spin-off company that uh, generates uh, uh, and operates in the field of origami structures, also used by Mercedes-Benz in the show car presented the CES 2020. So I haven't known Jenny for several years uh, and I'm extremely impressed to see how rapidly she has become a brilliant scientist entrepreneur. So I'm very, very happy that she could accept our invitation to participate in the conference. And so let's welcome Professor Jenny Peck. Thanks, so Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for the invitation and I'm really happy to be uh, joining the IRIM um, number two. And unfortunately we are meeting online, but hopefully we can soon meet each other on the third edition. Um, let me just share my screen. Tell me if it's all good. Yeah. All is good. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks for the great introduction. That's much better than uh, who I thought I was. So I'm really happy to hear that from you, Barbara, who I respect enormously. And thanks to the organizers of IRM. Um, my name is Jamie Peck, and I am the head and the founder of Reconfig Robotics Lab. It's a long name of a, of a lab, so we call it RRL. Uh, what I want to talk to you today is about how I think the reconfigurability of robots will help us to understand ourselves better as humans, but also how we interact with the world. And the, the, the way I try to do, achieve this is by having the robots to give a softer interactive platform for them to understand us and for us to use them to achieve tasks that are fragile, safe, and more adaptive for our ever-changing needs. So the reason that we are asking this question to ourselves, not only from our lab, but in many of the other robotics lab, is because we are living in the world of pandemic, of course, but also a change shifting in, in technology, because we have accomplished so much in the past since the 1960s in terms of industrial revolution. And that's one of the reasons that we are able to call robotics part of science as well now. The reason is that we, why 
advancing the mechanical functionality of uh, existing machines, including robots, we understood there is a quite uh, a bar, the, the, the standard bar that we cannot uh, go over because they are limited by physical, uh, physical ability, either through materials or the structural mechanics. And these are all quite nicely optimized through simulator tools as well as design by augmenting their performance. And normally when you're talking about augmented performance of a machinery or robot, it's about their force and effector, speed, velocity, acceleration, and precision of overall system. And these are the criteria that are very important. That's how they're, the metric is measured of a machine to machine, a robot to robot. Their, their task accomplishment is also measured through this, um, these metrics. But like I said, we are living in a world where things are changing rapidly and we demand more from our robots. And so what do we demand? We demand them to be in a different environment, the environment that we live in. We don't live in the factory floors. We want to be in a constant uh, environment where like, there are constant flow of humans, constant flow of different tasks. So while the factory environment will allow you to have a highly predictable environment where there's no other workers, where the robots can be programmed. Compared to that, in the real world environment, we no longer observe that anymore. We have a real world environment where things are a little more random. We have people moving around, cars, cars moving around, children, animals, um, and elderly and different height of people and different cultural people. This is an environment that's highly unpredictable and there are constant random task uncertainties. The only certainty and the constant, um, uh, uh, constant uh, truth here is the randomness of the tasks and the changes. So in this case, beyond the augmented performance, what we demand of robots and machines is their augmented adaptability, reconfigurability, and safety so that they can execute their task in safer environment, but also actually have the missions to succeed. So if, if that's the case, what remains? What's the things that are making it very difficult for us to understand that what they are able to do? Well, in my case, I think the, the way we design, when we conceive the robots, is has to be rethought and rethought through. How you design robots that are constantly in a highly predictable environment definitely has a fixed design. They were, again, optimized for these type of mechanical performances. But if you're asking a question, how can robots be designed in pre you know, design so that they can address different tasks and different environments, it's quite a different, um, if a different uh, challenge. And I think there is, there is a, a strict uh, design as well as um, uh, a conundrum that we have to solve beforehand. The conundrum here is that while these four criteria of design is quite important, which are the four pillars of precision of the system, degrees of freedom, force exerted at the end effector, structural compliance. While these are four criteria that is quite important for designing any mechanical system, it becomes even more critical when you're trying to design a robot. I borrowed this image from a Professor Ida's paper from 2016. While these four criteria is quite important, they are quite difficult to achieve all at the same time. Actually, you cannot achieve all four at the same time. For example, when you want to achieve a high precision in system, which is signified here by error, you have to do that. You can only achieve that through losing overall degrees of freedom. You cannot have a high degrees of freedom and still expect high precision in the system. And then the relationship is reciprocal. Higher degrees of freedom, you will have lower precision in overall system. And that's natural. And same type of juxtaposing uh, conditions exist between structural compliance and a end effectors force exertion. When you want to have a higher force exertion at the end effector, you would have to do that at the cost of losing overall structural compliance. Higher the structural compliance, you would have a lesser force that is exerted at the tip. 
So as our Rawala says, well, how you would achieve these type of juxtaposing criteria is you stick to the one end or the other. So either you have a very robust a gripper or a manipulator, which has a lesser compliance than um, uh, tentacles that's made up of soft polymers. But you can still guarantee um, a higher force exerted at the manipulator. And then the different S spectrum would be lower precision overall, but higher structural compliance and high degrees of freedom of these uh, tentacle looking uh, manipulators. This is pick and choose. But what if you don't want to pick and choose? What if, and I, I was keep on saying, what if we want to have this type of manipulators in a real world environment where we are not quite sure what kind of task would be at hand, well, no pun intended. Well, human hand it actually adapts to this type of random task much, much better than any of their counterparts. And then this takes up on this yellow band, the golden band of optimizing and maximizing overall structure compliance and precision or optimizing the degrees of freedom and the force exertion. It does a, and then there's a good example, either with the same hand, the same hardware platform that can thread a needle in a small needle head or a same hand that can lift a very high weight. And then currently in, in, in types of a robot, there's no such, such a robot that exists out there right now. The reason is none of the robots were actually designed to address different types of tasks. Although it may not be the task at hand at the moment, I believe this is the application that we require on the earth as well as in space in very near future. The reason is we demand automation in many of the tasks and variety of tasks that we already know. And then those ones we don't expect immediately right now, but they're coming soon. So what are missing in academia as well as industry to address this type of challenge, a manipulator or robotic interface that can freely choose between these uh, golden band of design um, conundrum? Well, I think there are three things that's missing in, the, in, in literature. One is a novel design methodology that gives you a comprehensive uh, steps to designing new robots, not from scratch, not from intuition, but a steps that are established and transferable is knowledge. Second uh, aspect is the actuator solutions. We do not have too many choices. We, we do not have enough choices of actuators that we can use uh, for this new design, new design paradigm that can follow the new design methodology or even existing design methodology. We don't have enough actuator choices and let alone sensor choices, but really we need an actuator that can be more adaptable to this novel type of um, robots. And third is a multi-system integration. It doesn't matter what kind of actuator choices, sensor choices, controllers, body, different materials you use. If you're not able to put them all together to be a single robotic body, you are not gonna be able to achieve a comprehensive system. So I think we really need to address this multi-system integration as a part of a study. How do we optimize this integration if it were to even happen? And also using this body, the integrated body that is encompassing of different uh, core components of robot to do bi-directional control. Bi-directional control, not only to feedback loop control the actuators themselves to control the, control the, um, the, the end effectors of the robot, but also the robot itself understanding what's going on outside its world. And then using that as part of input to adopt its behavior. So this is the third three aspects that my lab is focusing on in terms of research and studies. And uh, I can give you, uh, that's, that's, I can give you, and I hope that for the, for the next uh, half an hour, I can convince you, it's really the reconfigure robots that's developed in our lab that's addressing these three different level of challenges in, um, in changing par paradigm of robotic design. So I will give you a little plug-in of, uh, of, of a lab because I will, it's a couple of the robots, but not all of them. So we are located in Switzerland and Lausanne. And we, it's, our expertise is really in uh, developing unique robotic systems that does not exist out there, but they're characterized by their modularity, softness, interactivity, as well as um, a design format, which is often in origami form. 
So I'll talk about my origami robots developed in the lab. And then a second category of robots that are defined by their softness, either by materials or their interaction or their number of their degrees of freedom. We, not only we develop these soft robots, but we also study how to characterize them consistently and uh, objectively. And all of these origami robots and the soft robots, we try to stick to the modularity and modular systems so that they can be truly adaptable and reconfigurable depending on their tasks. And the individual modules are quite autonomous, so they can be at they can be plugged in and pl uh, plugged in uh, to create new format, but also they can be plugged in with a passive member as well. So, what are the really uh, our passion our, our passion for the applications? Well, I think the soft robots really are the um, the answers or the, the 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 answers that really answers the challenges in wearables. Wearables where it's highly interactive through control or actual physical contact and addressing them through um, different types of uh, um, uh, virtual reality or interactive systems. And that's why one of our spin-offs uh, is developing um, uh, interactive uh, uh, haptic, uh, haptic feedback joystick. Um, so I can talk more about that uh, throughout the, or toward the end of my presentations. Um, and we got a couple of different funding bodies where they're funding our efforts and bringing these origami robots to space and help out astronauts to communicate better in a more interactive manner. So that being said, um, I will first talk about novel design methodology. Um, it's a huge claim, so I'm not going to claim this is the way to design new robots and this is the way to, uh, uh, to, to, to investigate how the robot will um, address this adaptive task, but I can say this is one of the ways that we think it's, um, it's, it solves many of the problems that we address, uh, we, we face in trying to address different uh, levels of configuration of robot from a single platform. And we got the idea from um, paper folding origami. Um, the key aspect of origami that interest that that gives that it sparks interest in not only you know from my lab but a lot of scientists is the fact that they are coming from a single platform, a single platform that has multiple folds and multiple folds depending on the sequence of their fold and then the position of a fold they can create different three D objects. In this case, single piece of paper folds into rhinosaurus. And then you know exactly with that single piece of paper, you can also make airplanes and boats and frog, if you like. So why is this so exciting? Well, the fact is that you're changing the form, the actual physical form from a single mass, a single platform physically. And imagine if you can do this in an autonomous way. Well, if that's the case, you can have an autonomous origami platform that can change its form once it meets an obstacle of a small hole. You can crunch up to be a ball and then execute its task, in this case, turning into a spaceship. It's an extremely simple uh, scenario, but it will be a task that conventional robots won't be able to achieve. The reason is the environment would interfere with its direction, of, direction in the workspace. Here, the mission will continue, even though it's a small thing as a reconfiguring its body shape. But the, if you don't reconfigure its body shape, there is no way it can achieve this task. So if you want to make this animation a reality, what's required? What are the scientific challenges? Well, the scientific challenge is to put, is to put core robotic components in this thin layers thin layers that are sandwiched on top of each other. So in this case, you, what you see is a thin layer of body, sensor, microcontroller, even actuator, all within the same um, uh, thin sheet of a robot. And what we do is by inducing certain um, uh, current or electrical signal to activate certain folds, certain folds on and off, and even controlling the angle of the folds. And when you're able to control the angle of the folds and the sequence of the folds and the frequency, you're able to create robots that can autonomously interact with the environment. 
to create different body shape and execute different tasks. So that's an exciting use for us because we can have a single platform with multiple configurations. But that's not the only reason I'm excited about origami robot design methodology. The other one is, which is we often forget, is how we fabricate them. If you were to have a lot more effort in terms of fabricating this complex looking platform, then there is a little more to think about. But because they're flat, quasi 2D, we're able to take advantage of existing manufacturing uh, platform like MEMS. So you would have a material layer that's laser cut. You will layer up different materials. You put the um, discrete components and the final assembly. And then the magic really is the self-folding part. Why do I call this magic? The well, thing is, think about it. You're creating from the quasi 2 d materials, so basically sheets of material that goes through conveyor belt. You cut out the approximate shape. And from this quasi 2 d layers of materials and components, you're creating a three-dimensional robot for their self-folding. Once you're able to have a 3D robot from a quasi 2D conveyor belt, what happens is that the overall accuracy, the precision, the quality of the robot increases infinitely, exponentially, compared to the other type of robots that are 3D. 3D robots that are composed of hundreds of components that are in 3D requires manual assembly. This is the approach that would not require a manual assembly, regardless of how many layers you layer on the top. And because of this reason, we can think further. How we can think about streaming line this manufacturing process from the design process. What does that mean? Well, depending on your task space, you may require additional sensors. And you do actually need additional sensors, different types of microcontrollers, maybe extra limb, maybe an extra actuator. The, it all depends on your task space. Your task space will determine the change in design. The change in design will be represented in geometry and different type of mechanisms and the material choices as well. This is not quite new because well, most of us are familiar with how the, um, the design files work for 3D printers. These are the typical STL file information. But what's new? The fabrication sequence. Depending on the task, not only we're changing how they're designed, but also how they're fabricated. And because it's part of your design file, which I'm trying to push for, the Universal Design Library, we're able to feed in this design file into the conveyor belt of manufacturing lane of this origami robots. And the, the fabrication sequence, then pick and choose which fabrication sequence on top of the, which materials will be used. This will streamline the manufacturing process completely, still not requiring a manual assembly. And that means no manual assembly required, regardless of the updated design file based on the actual application. Application will drive the final assembly or the final product of a robot. We can actually achieve this circle of on-demand supply robots. And that's revolutionary. And I think that's where the strength of origami robots come in. So that's a lot of talk, that's a lot of vision. So where are we now in terms of origami robots? Currently we have, I will show you the latest one. Uh, well, it's not the latest one because it was published 2018, but this is one of our star robots where it shows that it does something really simple, but really well. It adapts to the environment. It changes its locomotive modes to address that. So, um, Z and Z made this robot and call it a tribot. It has three legs, but don't let the three legs fool you because it creates a lot of motion. So it's jam packed with excitement in the next couple of slides. But it doesn't matter how, how, how exciting this is, it is also manufactured quasi 2D. So on the left top screen, you see how it's layered. So you don't see the multiple layers, but you see how it starts with a completely 2D um, uh, robot, assembles into a 3D robot. And what does that mean? 3D robot can execute 3D task space. 
So normal terrain, a flat terrain, it's able to crawl forward nicely. And then same crawling can take you to, I think up to a, a little bit of a slope. So next screen, you will see this uh, tripod to climb up a slope of 10 degrees. But if you have a tighter slope or if you have a little rougher terrain, crawling no longer works. So what do you do? Well, you adapt to the environment. The mission is not failed. So the mission is to move forward. So in the rough terrain, using the exactly same platform, but activating different sets of actuators and reconfiguring its body shape in terms of its uh, angles between the uh, joints, as well as at the toe, the foot part, it's able to uh, roll over uh, a, a more a tougher terrain. How about if you introduce something a little more tougher, for example, introducing an obstacle, it's even able to hop it over. So this is a couple of examples of um, how the tripod can reconfigure its locomotive mode to even have fun. In this case, it's doing gymnastics, doing somersaults. So we, it really depends on how we are activating the sequence of different actuators and reconfiguring its locomotive mode. But what else can you possibly do? Well, what you saw on the initial graph or initial uh, GIF file was that it's creating from a single platform, it is creating this three dimensional robot. But you don't necessarily have to be stuck onto this a single platform. What if you had you bring in your friends? So Mori, uh, it's called modular origami robot, hence Mori. We looked at uh, different ways of introducing modularity. So instead of just being stuck with a single platform, now we have a module platform, which is still quasi 2D. So you see that active one on the left top, uh, one single triangle with three degrees of freedom uh, active motors. So active motors is basically running the uh, Mori on top of a flat uh, surface. But immediately, if you attach a passive module, so you, here we attach three passive modules without actuators, it's able to do something more creative. It expands its workspace. And depending on how they're kinematically linked, so here are the, the uh, three passive modules are attached, uh, it's sharing the um, edge. And then if we add additional active modules, so you have two active modules here with the four passive modules, it expands not only design space, but um, the workspace. And the next is really where your imagination takes you. You can create quad pad based on the Mori structures. Um, and then the, the, the question is which one you activate first and which one you, you activate later and creating different sequences of movements. It's all based on the origami platform. What's next? Well, the next thing about this Mori, the module origami robot, is thinking beyond actual a single uh, module, that homogeneous module, meaning the ones that you saw previous slide are exactly same size triangles sharing the same size sides. What if we can change the sides, uh, the size of the sides? That's exactly what happens when you're trying to do meshing of a reconstruction of a three-dimensional objects on virtual world. They're made of, they're meshed out of polymers, um, polygons. <laughs> when you're changing the length of your uh, triangles, you're basically creating infinite number of polygons. And that's what we're trying to see. How would a homogeneous modules expand its workspace and design space if they were to transform into heterogeneous modules? and have a choice in between. So those are the, some of the things that, that's waiting for us to um, uh, uh, share with you in a very near future. And using that type of origami robots, this is a little spoiler, uh, no pun intended again, we can achieve a different levels of degrees of freedom. For example, here, what you see is the airfoils on the back of the uh, Vision Avatar, the latest uh, concept car from Mercedes. Uh, let's see what's going to come up with next year, but uh, this is a concept car of 2020. Using this type of origami platform, we're able to create a very compact um, system, a platform that creates a three degrees of freedom on its uh, top end effector.
That's why you're able to see 36 of them directly on the back of the car, creating this uh, uh, three-dimensional movement. And I'll tell you more about what they are and how they're constructed toward my next slide. So the, remember the second point I was mentioning? Well, in order to achieve something like that, what you saw in the back of Mercedes, not only you need to think about how to make a system very, very compact, but the next thing you have to really worry about is, well, how do you actuate them? How small could the actuator be and what's the maximum torque it can produce? That's always the question. And if you want to use them as a wearable structures, how do we keep them safe and being effective? We need new actual solutions. So many of you who are familiar with the soft robotics um, community, one of the, our, our star and, uh, um, and the more, most excited, uh, one of the most exciting topics of soft robotics is using soft materials itself to create uh, actuators. And our lab is no different. We are using soft materials to be actual constituent material for a pneumatic actuator. Pneumatic actuators are not new, they've been around since the 60s, but what's new in recent years is that materials are using. Here we are using vacuum to create this very fluid motion. And what's very exciting for us is that not only we are able to control how they are moving, but also we can control their performance based on how we are injecting air and vacuuming the air out, but also their design and dimension as well as their orientation. And us, we are even making them modular. And that means we can not only confirm how individual modules performances like, but orient them and reconfigure them to create our uh, the robots that are, that are in need for our application. So what you see here is a vacuum SPA, vacuum soft pneumatic actuator, that's doing most typical robotic tasks, pick and place. So it's picking up some very light uh, plastic canisters and then dropping into uh, different, um, uh, different uh, bins. But like I said, it's super modular. So if you were to remove two modules, it's able to climb up a, a glass wall. And display its um, uh, range of motion by uh, shaking its, um, uh, its overall body. And if you were to add more modules, you can actually create different types of locomotive modes, either by crawling. And if you lose a couple of modules, on the way, the mission still don't, doesn't fail. It's able to still crawl forward. You, maybe the frequency of the modulation, uh, the sinusoidal uh, control would change, but it will still execute its task. Or be creative in terms of the gate patterns, just roll down. But what I'm trying to get here is that the modularity really introduces you, regardless of that your choice, can give you a much bigger choice of your task base. And then the task base is something that I really insist on because that's where you think adaptability to the environment really plays a high role when you're able to adapt, reconfigure overall structure of your robotic interface. Here, not only these are also modular devices or modular actuators that are arranged in, in a four by four quadrant. What we're controlling here is a stiffness of individual modules that can um, manipulate round ball, uh, ping pong ball, super light, and the heavier block that are made of aluminum. And by changing the frequency, not only you're changing the sequence of the actuators, but change the stiffness of these um, uh, pneumatic actuator modules, we're able to manipulate safely with these uh, uh, objects. So I introduced you to one of our novel actuators, a soft pneumatic actuator, among other smart actuators. But where I'm going with this, core components and the design idea or design methodology is that for a multi-system, multi-component robotic system, what's really important for the future of robotics or the future of the interactive robots is that how they can interact with the humans as well. This is not a new study. HR has been around for a long time, but for high degrees of freedom interface to interact with the environment, it poses even bigger questions or different questions. For example, I've been saying origami robots are meant to have high degrees of freedom with customizable folds and uh, configurations. Well, how would you be able to control it, let alone interact with it? 
first of all, we have to know the configurations, but how do you understand the configurations that I want or someone else wants when you only have a single platform? And that's what Jennings has been studying on, how to control this multi-degrees of freedom origami robot through a virtual environment. So virtual environment here is recreated through kinematic relationships of these uh, folding tiles. But what's neat, which is which is very much straightforward. But what's new here is that we actually have a physical platform that can be used to program the trajectory of these tiles. So, but that sounds simple enough. But the connection or the trajectory uh, introduction is not always straightforward because while the model that's induced on the virtual world is assuming a lot of uh, things that are not existing in the physical world. For example, thickness. For example, the flexibility between the joints. For example, the flexibility in the panels as well. And how your grounding is changing as well. The grounding environment of the, the robot is not always floating in the air and it never is, unless it's held up by the human hand. So all these boundary conditions introduce a difficulty or the challenges in terms of programming these origami robots. Another thing is that not everyone's going to have a robot in hand. So how that's done in typical um, robotic study is learning how to do master-slave uh, operations. So master-slave operations, basically you, the master can either work with the robot directly, and that's another robot is on the other end to producing a slave movement. But what if you don't have a robot on both ends? And what if your slave actually have, has another operator? When you have a master and master, how would you be able to control them? So that's one of the studies that we were looking at. How, what if you have a master, master, a master one, and not a master, but changing environment on the other end that the master is not aware of? These are the things, well, do you just give the haptic feedback to the master, or do you also give some level of autonomy to the other, uh, the other counterpart robot? So here we are not doing a master, master, or a master slave, but we have a master virtual model and a master robot on the other hand. So what Janning is doing is uh, moving around the virtual robot using his real hand and with that command, moving the actual robot on the other end. And if there were to be my hand interrupt with the robot here, the virtual model will reflect that directly onto the hand of, uh, or on, directly on, on, the, on the screen. But also the same thing happens the other way. If someone were to have their hand on top of this robot, they'll be able to feel the virtual hand, which is a real hand uh, read by the, the motion capture system, will be felt through the robot. So this is what I meant by the bi-directional control. What if you have more than one master? Where are the applications? So let me move on to, so th those are the three challenges I've been talking about. Um, novel design methodology, novel actual development, bi-directional control. So why do we need all these? And where could possibly bring the recovery of robots to? Well, there's probably, well, none of us really live with a robot unless you guys have a vacuum robot at home. But I think the immediate need or we need a very near, uh, near future need will be in space. Space is a very expensive place to take anything up to, even water, the most essentials. So bringing um, a robots that are meant to do one thing and only one thing may not just cut the mission. So what if you were to have a platform that is reconfigurable to address different types of challenges that are known or unknown? So in this case, what we were trying to illustrate is that we can have a robot that digs into the ground work on, on the ground and even above the ground. And maybe they're able to interact with astronauts within the spaceship to communicate with each other or make their lives easier because they cannot afford to have interns to hold up a, a test, uh, test specimen or communicate with people back on the earth or help out with their experiments. These origami robots or modular robots will help with their task, the daily task. And if you want to come back down to Earth, what are the applications? Unless you're an astronaut, yes, you would still have a, a use for these recovery robots. For example, 
an interactive virtual interface. Well, any of you who use some virtual reality goggles, you probably know. Graphic is amazing now. When you, when you wear the virtual reality glasses and if you're standing um, next to a cliff, you scream, I scream. Um, the, uh, the audio, the music, the audio, the sound effect is excellent. It's like you're actually at the scene. The only thing that you know that you're actually not in the scene is that you don't feel anything. Your hand is in the air. The biggest difference, or, but how would you be able to feel things? Well, you feel things through your skin and your skin, but the, the sensation is not just cutaneous, but also kinesthetic. That means your, sen your, your immediate skin needs to be stimulated, but also your bones and your muscles need to feel the difference as well. So these are the areas where reconfigure robot solution actually helps out. So using the soft pneumatic actuators, origami structures, we are able to create, or we are working on um, multiple different, multiple levels of solutions to give a haptic feedback to, to the body. So we have a wearable that gives you a force feedback on the shoulders, obliques, and the lower back that allows to um, give you not only haptic feedback, the actual force feedback, but also you give you assistance if you're about to fall on the ground or lose your um, equilibrium. Um, the modular robots also help out with that as, uh, aspect as well as the application as well. Um, but I will talk more about how we are using very, very thin pneumatic actuators to actually give a sensation back to, or give additional sensation to the fingertips. Um, those are called SPA skin, soft pneumatic actuators, that would go directly on top of your fingertips. Fingertips there are very thin and it matches pretty much of the uh, Young's module of the actual human skin that it feels very comfortable and you are able to execute normal tasks that you would require to do with your fingertips. And if you're in lane with them uh, with actual sensors, a soft stretchable sensor, so here made by Professor Lacour's group at EPFL, you're able to not only feedback loop control, your pneumatic actuator, in this case is a bubble. So higher the bubble goes up, it induces higher force, so, and then higher strain. So it's able to feedback will control it. But with the same sensor, you're able to detect any type of incoming disturbances or a changing environment. The changing environment here is actually the, the pen. The pen is pushing on it, and we know there's extra load. And this allows us to use this information to know if your wearable structure is actually donned on or donned off. And by placing them around your um, a forearm, in this case, four by four braille, you're able to not only feel the force up to one newtons with a resolution of one, 10 millinewtons, and then the change in force in a different frequency up to 100 hertz, you're able to feel something like um, actual uh, braille message location, shape, pattern. Um, you were able to recreate these type of um, signals, rich sensation, they're really organic, um, directly in your form without relying on your visual or auditory feedback. And these are quite exciting because we are now talking about feeling the messages, feeling, um, getting additional haptic feedback in addition to your visual auditory feedback, which means you don't know, you, you no longer have to rely on the feedback that you're relying on in the visual sense. And if you are talking about not only the fingertips, but we can also use a whole hand to actually get the feedback because our general um, uh, intuition is to grab onto things. So imagine if we can actually have a changing in stiffness, softness, shape directly underneath your fingertips. And this case, uh, tangible in this idea with a Z, where we're trying to create a physical interface that creates changes shape and creates a different dimensions of understanding of the environment, either virtual or real. A uh, smaller version, this is a thimble that creates, again, the sensation underneath the fingertip by creating a shear forces as well as, a, as, as displacement. So we call this a thimble haptic origami. 
Um, and then because it's of size, we are, had to rely on the origami transmission that allows you to have a very compact packaging while creating this three degrees of freedom movement directly on your fingertips. So this is probably the world's smallest uh, haptic feedback uh, device for your fingertips. And um, if you don't want to wear it, but if you want to hold on to it for your gaming purposes, here's a fold away. Fold away is one of our spin-offs that I created with Marco Salerno and Stefano Minchev, um, who are the really the experts in origami robots as well, um, who came up with the idea of using this origami platform for a joystick. And here, um, Alex actually has that uh, fold away underneath his fingertip. So what you're seeing on the virtual reality screen, um, Alex is wearing the VR glasses, and what you, he's seeing is a blue ball, red ball, and black ball. Well, that's what we see. But what Alex sees and feels is a blue rubber ball, red sponge ball, and black billiard ball. The reason is not only he feels the shape of these balls, but also feel the stiffness of individual ones. And that's really exciting. For this smaller platform that you can feel what you're seeing is really revolutionary in terms of what you're able to produce as well as transfer in terms of information. And that means, you're, again, the imagination, you can, let, you can let go of your imagination in terms of the applications. So you can explore different types of images now. Your image could be uh, um, a beating heart. So if you have a beating heart or, or rib cages that is hard, you will feel the hardness of rib cage. And as you're going up and down intercostal muscles, they'll become soft. And then if you go to the beating heart, you will see, you will, you'll feel the beating of the heart. Obviously, this information can be customized, so you can make your rib cages, you know, expand more as you're breathing harder. You can make your heart to beat slower. You name it. These are the data you can change and customize the actual physical output of what the user is going to feel. And imagine when you're shopping online, when you're looking at different animals online, you're looking at different fruits or, um, uh, or, or texturized um, uh, grounds or, or fabrics, you can go and feel it as a joystick on your, on your desktop. And that would be changing how we are communicating through Zoom now. I guess we can actually start using this as a um, you know, shaking hands with me if, that's, uh, if we all were to have our joysticks in hand. So I hope I convinced you there are a lot of applications for uh, Greek coffee robots that are going to address different types of environments. And there are three levels of, or three different types of the challenges we need to address actual solutions, design methodology, and multi-system integration for bi-directional control. And the application that not only my lab is working on, but also that opens up door to uh, different labs as well as scientists to look at different ways they can use reconfigure robots in their studies as well as developments. And I, I must address that my students and my group of amazing PhDs and postdocs are the ones who's really doing uh, amazing work in these fields. So, and I have, to, um, I have to recognize my funding sources as well. So I, I, I'm very grateful to all of them and their support. And I, I thank you for listening and I'm open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. It's uh, yeah, we are fully convinced, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> and uh, I'm really impressed, really, by by the results, by the the approach that you propose, and um, it's. I mean, really, uh, you clearly uh, present the, the challenges in uh, definition, identification of the criteria, you now in the design, also the combination of design manufacturing that is uh, absolutely another challenge is uh, towards uh, these uh, new trends in soft robotics. Uh, and about that, uh, I want to, I mean, uh, know your opinion about the, the challenges also in the materials. You know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we have to develop a soft sensors, uh, I mean, uh, circuits, uh, actuators. So this is uh, one of the main challenges of our 
research activities. Uh, and uh, before you, we, we had a roundtable on uh, uh, sustainability technologies uh, and uh, robots and uh, intelligent machines for our planet. So also in this direction, uh, I would you like to know your opinion. So what do you think about, uh, uh, about the, the future of the material and how soft robots, uh, soft robotics uh, can face uh, these challenges, uh, can help our planet? So what is your vision about that? Um, good question. Sustainability is a really a key word in, um, in in our society right now, not only because it's important, but because it's critical. It's critical for the future of everyone. It doesn't matter how more intelligent and autonomous systems become or how e efficient things become. If we have an environment, our own environment that does not work for us or they de decides to give up, uh, then I guess it would be you know, really the end of us. And I think today they announced that as of today, we have more things man-made on the earth than the natural nature itself. So we have more stuff that we made on the earth than actual nature. Basically, we're creating our own doom um, in this world. And as a roboticist, we, we should actually take responsibility in terms of how to address things better and make the world a better place. To be honest, I have not, I am not a material scientist, but it's not an excuse to not think about how sustainable our robots can be. I hope through the new design methodology, we can be more effective in terms of how we optimize robots to do multitasking. So instead of, I'm gonna use shopping as an example. So if you were to buy uh, a specific equipment for the kitchen, instead of buying multiple different tools to do 10 different things, like you probably need 20 different equipment to do 10 different uh, uh, dessert menus. I don't know how many equipment you need to make a tiramisu, but there's gonna be a lot of kitchen equipment you need to buy. But if you have a really strong hand and if you have a very uh, 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 versatile tool, then you may just need to, can just do with one bowl and one whisk and uh, one uh, stove top like old grandmothers used to do. So uh, my hope is that if we have a reconfigurable robots, a single platform that can be reusable and only updated when you need it, when they're broken, I think it can be a one approach to more sustainable technology development, having a platform that can reconfigure to different tasks and environments. But obviously it's a huge challenge, of course. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with you. And uh, probably as a scientist, uh, we also have to you know, think about the, 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 what is the, the, the future and how we can address it. So I totally share uh, your point. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a question. You discussed novel design methodologies and novel actuators for systems uh, merging softness and rigidity. These approaches led to the development of several very different systems for very different possible application. Do you think there is a way to benchmark them? Uh -huh. Do you think this field is ready for benchmark? Well, it depends on what you mean by ready. Um, it's ready to be shared. So I just gave you a little bit glimpse and we have two papers out on the design methodology. And we propose a little bit of flow chart, how to go about it. Currently, it's very much limited to origami robots. And obviously I cannot claim this is open for all origami robots either. But we suggest that if you have multiple folding joints, these folding joints can be used to be either structural folding joint or active folding joint. And if it's active folding joint, could it be mixed with other transmissions? So yes, to a certain extent we're proposing it and I hope we can catch on and then have more, uh, uh, or we could have the community be more excited about them. Um, and hopefully it can be shared as in library. So um, having, because what we are able to do right now is recreating traditionally classical mechanical joints like the ball socket joints, spherical joint, parallel joint, sliders, a prismatic joint, be recreated in origami joints already. And we are proposing different ways of actuating it. In that case, I think it's not 
too far off to think that um, other uh, scientists can use this as a platform to, um, oh, wow, someone does not have their thing on me, uh, to, to create their um, uh, ro uh, robotic platform. So yes, to a certain extent, um, but they're, it's, it's, it's open now. Yeah, I, I hope you can, you, I can get more people excited. I'm very interested also by your uh, um, experience as an entrepreneur, as I said. So you are a very brilliant scientist, but also you have uh, this experience. Uh, and so I think that it's very interesting also for uh, the, the younger researcher and students to know how you how you can uh, merge and combine you know, these two different words if you want. It's not <laughs> easy to have you know, uh, the, both the approaches. So I'm very interested to know how you can do that. I mean, uh, what is your approach and uh, your vision in both you know, the, the directions? I don't know. I think it depends on who you're asking. If you were to ask my um, my students, that means you know Jamie's always busy. <laughs> but I don't think that's a really good answer either. Um, uh, I think uh, surrounding myself with great students and colleagues, I think that I, I've been really lucky. Uh, I, I so I, I have to give a shout out to Marco and Stefano, who are the actual the uh, the main uh, drivers to the to the industrialization of uh, the origami robots. Um, I think if if you surround yourself with a good people and motivate people, I think that's exciting. Uh, but not only you, you can't just get excited, you should make yourself available to be criticized and be ready to help them out. So if you're listening as a postdoc in a lab and you, if you want to convince your supervisor, not only show the motivation, but see how far you are willing to go. And if you're a young you know, assistant professor or if you're just starting a group, then see who, with whom you can uh, push your current um, research to become a product. Because you'll be surprised uh, if you show that's an option, your students and your, your researchers will actually react to that as well. So I think it's really, no one can do everything by themselves. So try to get help and then try to tell them and share the idea that it is a possibility. Great. There is another question from a lady uh, before Emanuela, now Laura. Uh, thank you, Jamie. A <laughs> fantastic speech, as always. I follow up the input of Barbara and yes, it's on the sustainability. Uh, so she wants to know uh, aspect of the energy related <laughs> to origami rabbits. Right, right. <laughs> hey, Laura. How are you um, doing? <laughs> yeah, so to be honest, um, smart materials are not the most energy efficient nor um, environmentally sustainable solutions just yet. Um, and like I said, I'm not the materials expert, so those are not the ones that I'm trying to optimize. But my effort in terms of uh, addressing environmental impact of robots is that uh, using the, the capacity of robots to be used for environmental benefits. So one of our origami robot slash soft pneumatic actual robot actually traveled to Chile uh, about two years ago to find a solution for um, minimizing water shortage or, or optimizing water or improving water shortage in Chile. Chile's uh, um, uh, wine vineyard to, to help the grapes grow. So what we were ended up doing was, again, remote areas, different environments, you cannot have robots that are customized for those environments. So you need robots that are adaptable to those uh, remote areas and so, Collapsible or gyre robots are very compact, hence the minimal transportation uh, efforts and energy to bring them to remote areas. And then using solar power um, for powering them so they can be energy-wise sustainable. And because they are light and um, uh, modular, we were able to reuse them for different locations of uh, remote area. So those are the directions that we're taking in terms of how to uh, be improving the or be, be more sustainable for the environment. So it's not going to be necessarily in terms of the material itself or or the actual um, uh, actual composition of the uh, composition of the uh, robot, but in terms of the application and the fact that we can reuse them and reconfigure them. Yeah. 
The last quick uh, uh, question uh, from uh, Salvatore. How can you choose the torque of the origami is uh, joined? Uh, sorry, how can, how can we torque the origami joints? Well, good yeah. question. Well, do you want the honest answer or the, uh, <laughs> the publication of all answer? <laughs> the honest one. <laughs> the honest one is it depends on the performance of your actuator first. Usually it's not the origami joint state. Oh, that's not true actually, depending on the origami joint. So the biggest failure mode, actual failure mode for our origami robots is the delamination because like I said, it's a sandwich of multiple different layers. And the science of glue is not that well studied. They're well studied for specific uh, uh, surfaces where the glue manufacturer actually gives out the data sheet. But when you're gluing, different materials that are never meant to be glued. And if you have a different um, surfaces, uh, they're not that clean. Uh, we, we, we say gray room because we cannot claim our labs are you know, clean room level. So I say gray room level, different debris impact the glue. So the glue performance actually is a huge factor in the robustness of these origami joints. Say your origami joints are perfectly robust. How do you choose a torque? Well, it depends on what your battery power is. If you want it to be onboard battery, how much of battery power can you take? Say if we have infinite power, uh, infinitely robust joints, in that case, it depends on what's the worst case scenario for your origami robots to need to go in. So normally, that being said, your even though origami joints are really thin and flexible, it's usually the limited by the, um, the battery power. For the locomotive robot that you saw and, and, and the tribot specifically, that's the one that you're referring to. We had two different types of uh, shame memory alloy um, actuators. And depending on the actuator type, size, parameter, material, their torque changes. So it really depends on the actual geometry and the overall power capacity. Okay, so we have to end, uh, unfortunately, the session. So I want to thank you again, Jenny. It was thank great, uh, really. And uh, uh, you can see again, Jenny, and uh, her great results uh, on the channel of the conference on YouTube uh, and uh, also Facebook. Uh, and so thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Ciao. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.